I titled today's story, uh, What Happens When Everything Fails? And I want to lead up to that a little bit. So there's a famous Zen story about a Zen master called Basso. And Basso was the grandson of the sixth patriarch, one of the founders of Zen. He was a very big, very strong man, very powerful. And he was sick one day and he didn't show up for Zazen or he'd been sick for a week. And the temple master went to see him and said, uh, how are you feeling? And Basso said, sun-faced Buddha, moon-faced Buddha. Uh, in Japanese, that's Nichimen Butsu and Gachimen Butsu. And sun-faced Buddha is supposed to live for 1,800 years. And the moon-faced Buddha is supposed to live for only a day and a night. And the thing that separates you and I from Basso is that he was completely uh, at ease with whichever one it was. It was not that he was disinterested, but his understanding had reached a level where he was able to perceive everything as the Dharma, as Buddha, whatever occurred, living or dying. I have to say, my practice is not that perfect. And by and large, most people I run into is not. But this is the world that we live in. And we can't, in the everyday world, we have a lot of trouble accepting everything. Even though we may know that, um, yes, everything is a projection, a letter from emptiness. Uh, there is no difference between Donald Trump and me. Um, and yet, some things we like and some things we don't like. And if we don't like it, we can't accept it. And when we don't like it or when we, when we like it or we don't like it, we're always comparing and adjusting and collating. What is it? What do I like about this? What do I don't like about this? What will the implications of this be? And so in a very real way, we are committed to picking and choosing. And it's not that picking and choosing is wrong any more than relating to a self is wrong. It's just not the whole picture. And without the whole picture, we get in trouble. So what's the whole picture? The whole picture is emptiness. And the way we approach emptiness and the way we uh, nourish it and the way we um, come in contact and practice it is through sitting zazen. It's almost impossible to keep this zazen mind all the time in our practice, in our everyday practice. But we, we try. We do it. Because on some level we know that just a contradictory world, just a world of, of dualisms, is never going to be whole. It's never going to be healed. So, if we stick, if we stick to either one or the other, if we stick to even non-discrimination, the big holistic view, that's a kind of discrimination, isn't it? We're still picking between uh, sun-faced Buddha and moon-faced Buddha, as opposed to accepting whatever comes up. Accepting doesn't mean being passive. It means seeing it as it is and seeing it without over much thinking, without comparative thinking, without uh, judgments, without, va without value judgments, good and bad, which is kind of the rule of our contradictory reality. And you can't do this with the kind of ordinary effort that we make in our everyday life. And one of the things that's quite extraordinary about Zen practice and about Suzuki Roshi is this sense of extraordinary effort. It really requires a dedication to wisdom, to zazen, to a strictness with ourselves, to make ourselves do it, to refer to it over and over again. He has a wonderful phrase that he uses uh, for himself, Suzuki Roshi, which is apt to. APT. One is apt to. 
And what it means is uh, there's nothing wrong with having a cookie when you feel like it, but you're apt to want more. And to be able to take one cookie when you really want it and then be strict and stop yourself, like me, from eating 12 is an understanding of this latent capacity in our mind to be apt to do something, likely to do something. And the way we learn those aptitudes and the way we learn those likely to is by zazen and studying ourselves and setting mm, strict forms for ourselves, Because we don't bump into the edges of the self until we set a, we set a law, until we set a form. When I first came to Zen Center and started to sit, I just hated it. I mean, I'd spent 10 years in the counterculture doing exactly what I wanted to, whenever I wanted to. And to my febrile little, barely post-adolescent mind, uh, that was enlightenment. That was, that was freedom. I'm good with everything. Well, if I'd been honest, <laughs> I would have learned that I wasn't good with everything. There was a whole lot that I wasn't good with. I wasn't good with capitalism. I wasn't good with racism. I wasn't good with nuclear weapons. I wasn't good with aggression. I wasn't even good with people I didn't like. So when I got to Zen Center, and... Um, sorry, somebody's calling me. When I got to Zen Center, I just... The, the forms and the rigidity made me nuts. I had to get up at 5.30. I had to get up at 5 to get into Zendu at 5.30, I think it was. Or I had to get up at 5.30 to be there at 6. And I had to be on time or I had to stand in the hall. And I had to sit with my legs folded and my knees hurt. And I had to have a mudra and I had to pay attention to my breathing. And I had to put emphasis on my stomach or put my mind in my palms. There was 10,000 things to remember. And I just kept railing against it in my own mind until one day I realized, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> this is my mind doing all this complaining and sniveling and what is it I expect? And I began to look at what those complaints implied and what I expected and what my ideas about Zen were. And it turned out after about a year or so, I, I began to really appreciate these forms and strictures because they showed me the edges of myself. They showed me the, the undeveloped parts of myself. So, why am I getting to this? The idea is that whatever comes up in Zazen, comes up in Zazen. That this is the place where we can practice. When we hear a noise, we don't ask ourselves, what is it? Where is it? Oh, it's a loud noise. It's a small noise. It's a bird. What kind of bird is it? Zazen is where we practice accepting whatever comes up. And it takes extraordinary effort to do that because it's we've been practicing our entire lives at discriminatory thinking. And so one of the reasons we have to be strict and one of the reasons we have to sit every day is it takes a great deal of energy and effort to overcome these latent habits and stuff that we've made. So in ancient Japan, <clears throat> the samurai warriors, you know, those sword masters, their real battlefield was the zendo because what they discovered was in a contest of kill or be killed, your mind was your greatest adversary. If you were responding to anything other than the motions and the activity of your opponent, you were in real trouble. And if you were afraid to die, that was going to inhibit your choices of action. This action might expose me to death, but it might also be the best action which could win the battle for me. And so they found in Zen practice and in meditation a kind of freedom from life and death, which made them the kind of phenomenal warriors they were reputed to be. So... If, if we have fear, if we have anxiety, that puts a complete limit on what our responses can be. So, there are two ways that we can react to any situation. 
there's the dualistic way and there's the holistic way. There's the judgmental, good and bad, either or, up, down, or there's it's all Buddha. And it's not that I'm going to ask you to get rid of one or, or choose the other, but what's really important is that we be able to switch between them without thinking. And once they're co-equal in our understanding, once they have equal valences in our mind, then we have complete freedom. If we're still struggling to understand that it's all Buddha, everything that comes up is okay, we're not going to be able to take that option or the information from that option without some struggle, without some tension, without some inhibition of our motion. And the same is true. If we're in a fight for our life, oh my God, killing is bad. Should I kill this person? Should I not? Oh, he's just like I am. We have to be free from all that. And so the only way that we're free from all that is, is to be, to have access to a place where there are no contradictions. And that place is all of it. That place is emptiness. Suzuki Roshi, in one of his lectures, was very funny. He said, you know, there is no Buddha. There is no thing we can call Buddha. And because there's no Buddha, that's why we bow to Buddha. Buddha was the person who taught us there was no Buddha. So we're not studying Buddhism to all become teachers. That's not the highest aspiration of Buddhism. We're not studying Buddhism to build big Zen centers, to turn the United States into a Buddhist country. We're studying, we're studying Buddhism and particularly Zen to make ourselves vessels of helpfulness to others, to clarify our own contradictions, to clarify our own internal strictures so that we go, can go out in the world and help other people. That's what it's really about. It doesn't matter to me if you do it as a Buddhist or as a Catholic, as a Muslim, it doesn't matter. It's your intention that matters. But when you go out there, you have to have a full toolkit especially in this day and age. And this is what I keep coming back to. <clears throat> you know, we have this fantastic, vexing technology that makes me, <laughs> pushes me to the ver verge of psychosis. Daily, something comes up that is not only inconvenient, but completely stops my forward motion. And my, uh, my wife, Stephanie, used to get really cross with me when we were driving someplace. And as soon as we would hit a traffic jam, I would pull off and start going some long backward route because I just wanted forward motion. And she would say, you're going the wrong way. This is not the good way to go. And I would say forward motion. I get frustrated easily when my, when my forward motion is, is blocked. But it strikes me as curious that we have all this technology, but we don't actually have human beings that are able to care for each other, that are able to argue uh, yin and yang, yes and no, what's the best course. It's kind of astounding. We have nuclear weapons that can destroy all of humanity and all of the planet and yet we haven't changed as human beings one iota. We haven't. We may have better content to our thinking. We may have understanding of ecology. When somebody cuts us off in the car, we may have flipped them the bird before we know it. And we don't understand that that gesture is perilously close to pulling a trigger. So one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to become fully human. We're not trying to become Buddhists. We're not trying to become Zen adepts. It's useful to call ourselves Zen students because then we don't have to worry about status and wealth and anything else. We're just Zen students. And it puts us on a plane from which we can't f fall below it. Yes, we can meet the president. Yes, we can do great and famous things. But if we think of ourselves as Zen students, we will know. 
how far we have to go. We will know the state of our mind. And the state of our mind will be revealed to us by how adept we are at following those forms, how adept we are at hearing a sound and letting it just be a sound. I don't have to say, oh, it's a Camp J. So I guess what I'm saying is that limitations are critical to us. Limitation has meaning. Limitation, sun-faced Buddha, moon-faced Buddha, doesn't mean that Basso was indifferent. It's not that at all. If you can enjoy sun-faced Buddha, if you can enjoy moon-faced Buddha, if you can enjoy being sick, if you can enjoy being healthy, that's non-discriminating. It's not that you don't care. It's that you can fully commit to whatever arises. That's accepting it. Now, enter the modern world. Enter today. I keep talking about uh, politics on these Dharma talks because I see that politics are really a reflection of the state of the internal life of Americans. And when things are reaching a pass where, uh, on a video the other day, I saw a fellow screaming that putting masks on children was child abuse. I saw another man threatening a school board member, telling her, we know where you live. So this tells me that there is a rage afloat that I'm not sure everyone is taking seriously. I don't want to be the expert on it. But it seems to me that there's a struggle right now to prove that government can serve the people. And I would make the argument that if you look at the history of our government, let's just say from 1970, Ronald Reagan on, there's been a gradual usurpation of political power by wealth. Because our political system is organized around money, and the Supreme Court has said that the giving of money is free speech, those with the most money have the most speech. So you and I can talk all we want, but we're not going to make a dent in Fox News. But this is the way it is. So what do we do when everything seems to be failing around us? There are many people, myself included, who are anticipating some sort of armed conflict between red and blue states in 2024. What do we do when everything we've, we've built and we've depended on all our lives is falling apart? We're not going to get out of it by expressing anger. We're not going to make anyone listen to us by expressing anger. Anger itself is the enemy. But just like everything, anger has a cause. And widespread political anger comes out of the moment before it and the moment before it and the moment before it. And just by my cursory review, in the last 50 years, the power of wealth has taken the ownership of the middle class down from 20% of the national wealth down to 12%. It's not educated or protected them from understanding that in a global economy, certain jobs are going to gravitate to countries where it's cheaper and easier to do them. Most nations dedicated a great deal of money to retraining their workers. The United States dedicated less than any other industrial country. And what are the consequences of that? The consequences of that are as the family farm was eradicated, due to regulation and banking pressure, as uh, industries disappeared due to GATT and NAFTA, the people were not looked after. Anyone could predict that if you loosen bank regulations, the banks are going to steal the money. That's what the savings and loan scandal was about. Stole $250 billion 
of private savings pensions from people all across the country. And yet, less than 20 years later, Bill Clinton deregulated the banks and the same thing occurred with the crash of 2008. So what do we do? Because these are huge historical forces at work. And I can sit here and say, yeah, we need full federal funding of elections. We need to prohibit um, gifts from lobbyists to legislators. And we need to disallow corporations from spending their treasure to influence public policy. But those are all memes because the system itself is organized around money. And the trouble that we see in front of us didn't begin with Donald Trump. But he was the brutal face of it. He was the face of a kind of change where the wealthiest people in America abandoned noblesse oblige and abandoned responsibility to their workers and the communities they lived in. And they followed people like Milton Friedman, Chicago School economist, who claimed that the only responsibility of a business was its return to shareholders. Now there's an example. There's an example of enlightened idiocy. There's an example of taking the human intelligence and narrowing its focus so much and excising all the other shareholders in an argument that you come up with a perfectly logical solution that has not destroyed, but pushed the country to where it's teetering on the edge of destruction. And what's the destruction I mean? The destruction is that the wealthiest people in the United States have decided to go all out to preserve their wealth and their privilege. And the attacks in the Capitol, it turns out, if you read The New Yorker, the big money behind the big lie, were well-funded, well-funded by billionaires who made videotapes and sent them around the country so that people would think this was a mass movement. So these are huge historical forces. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is calm down and try to understand it. Look after our own health. In the airplane, you put your mask on first before you help other people. And then look at what's at hand. Do you know your neighbors? Are you on good terms with your neighbors? Have you made emergency lists of your neighbors so if something happens, you can call them or you can see that they're free of fire or flood or mudslide? If there's something bothering you, is there something you can do about it immediately? Maybe it's giving money as much as you can. Maybe it's uh, writing letters. I don't have a lot of faith in online petitions, but I have a lot more faith in letters directly to legislators. They say, when I was in politics, the, the maxim was one letter's worth a hundred votes. So just think. Think what a thousand letters does to a legislator. So I guess what I'm saying is that there's a very good chance that we could go through a long period where America falls farther apart than anyone could have ever anticipated. We're the same human beings that live in Afghanistan, that live in Iraq, that live in Syria, that live in Yemen, that live in Venezuela, that lived in Uruguay. It's not beyond the possibility of doubt that we could lose all faith in our election or have 70 million people who do, which is exactly what's being orchestrated now. So while these things concern me, there's not much I can do about it. I can talk about it. I can talk about it in a non-threatening, non-judgmental way with people and see if I can open up avenues of feeling and discourse that uh, might make them receptive to listen. I can't do it by brute force. It won't work. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should respond to intimidation. 
I mean, if somebody said to me, I know where you live, as uh, they said to the, to the teacher at the school board meeting, I think I would want to find out where that person lived and send them a note, said, I know where you live too. Uh, we don't have to respond to, to bullying. We don't have to respond to threat. But the way that we respond is what differentiates us as Zen students or just reflexive people doing what arises. And you remember in the Four Noble Truths, the first was Dukkha, which was basically the pepper-filled wind that blows in the face of everyone. There's no living thing that's not under stress and that's not under some affliction. The Buddha called it a noble truth. Truth because it's real and noble because it's worthy of respect. And the second noble truth was that when a pepper wind blows in your faces, stuff arises. You can't help that either. The driver cuts you off, you want to give him the finger. Or if you had a pistol, you want to shoot him. Or you want to run him off the road. You can't help that either. What you can help is the next step. And this is where the Zen of it comes in. And the third noble truth is called containment. That once you understand that there's nothing that we can't see and contain when it arises, and that the moment it arises, it's our problem. The moment it arises, cut the trigger out of it. The guy cuts you off, anger arises, cut that guy out of it. And now you're left owning your anger. Now it's yours to understand, to clarify, to purify. That's your work. There'll always be things that arise in you. You can't blame the triggers. Uh, I've managed to get my reaction down when things happen on the road to really? I still get angry. I still get cross. I still wish I had a James Bond rocket missile in my car. But I just say, really? And I feel better. And I haven't really spread violence. So each of us is going to have to discover in our own way, how we're going to walk the Eightfold Path. If we're serious about it, we don't let ourselves off the hook for right speech, for right employment, for right understanding, for right energy. We use those things to check ourselves moment after moment after moment because we've learned that they sprung from an enlightened mind and they basically replicate an enlightened life. And we're going to go through life struggling with both the singular, the either or, the I like, I don't like, and the letters from emptiness, emptiness itself. And we're going to struggle with them until we become, uh, we have equanimity between them. And we can take whichever we need immediately reflexively, intuitively, without overmuch thinking about it. So I'm not trying to make politics over important, but I'm concerned that there seems to be a great deal of uh, diffidence on the part of the one remaining political party that structures are being put in place in broad daylight to reverse the electoral wishes of the people. Secretaries of state are being appointed who are pledged to Donald Trump. And they are now being given the right to choose their own electors if they don't like the electors that the people chose. So that's a very different America. That's a very scary America. That's the core of America that's being mobilized against day in and day out, right in, front, right in front of our eyes in broad daylight. So I can only see one way out of that myself in the short term is actually helping the responsible party that's governing, whether I like them or not, they're not perfect. 
Biden is not perfect. The Democrats are not perfect. I used to say they, but they, sh they share more of what they steal. But unless the Democratic Party can get money in the pockets of working class America, unless they can get them medical help, unless they can get them uh, daycare so mothers can return to work, things are going to get very, very, very bad. And my feeling is that if we can do that, it'll be like Obamacare, even if we have to do it for only a year. We don't need to look at that as a defeat. It'll be like Obamacare. Once people get these benefits, they will not let you remove them. I forget how many times the Republican Party tried to cancel Obamacare, and they couldn't. And so it could be the same with infrastructure and daycare and broadband everywhere and medical benefits and expanding Medicare in, in red states. And so myself, I would dedicate some part of every day. This is what I do. I dedicate some part of every day to either writing a check, writing a letter, calling a legislator's office in support, doing a phone bank, something that you can do to actually ensure that you've thrown the full weight of your intention behind the people that you think will govern in the way that's most in accord with your inner life, your sense of compassion, the thing that brought you to Zen practice. It will not be perfect. Even a perfect <laughs> president will not be perfect. So I say this because I think we're at such a critical moment that not to say it is irresponsible and not to recognize that we share many of the, we share all the characteristics of the people we're fighting against. And unless we can contain them and demonstrate that we can contain them, we are losing the argument because the argument is not going to be handled on intellectual grounds. I said once uh, earlier in the year around the time of George Floyd that a protest is an invitation to a better world. And people don't accept invitations when they're being screamed at. And for my money, the best demonstration would be everyone sitting Zazen. But failing that, it would be everyone standing in disciplined silence, holding signs. Because the real audience is not the police who've angered you or the politicians who've angered you. The real audience is the American people who live between the Alleghenies and the Sierras. They're the ones watching. And they're the ones that are deciding which side they're on. They were the ones that sided with African Americans in the late 50s and 60s because of the dignity of their struggle against bestial racism. It was the behavior of the protesters, dressed as if they were going to church, never raising their voices unless they were in song, sitting in, allowing these people to beat them so that they could get a crappy hamburger at Woolworths. And it made the line between the two so clear that the American people said, this is what we want. And they forced Lyndon Johnson to sign the Civil Rights Act. It's hard to consider today. The voting, first Voting Rights Act was signed almost unanimously by the Republicans. But it's a different time. And if we expect different governance, we have to be different voters. And we have to set the example on the model of how we want government to be and to talk. And I have my pipe dreams about full federal funding of elections, as they are in many places in Europe. But they're pipe dreams until we should get 60 or 70 seats in the legislature. And unless we learn to be civil to our neighbors, even the ones we disagree with, we'll never get 60 or 70 seats because the country's divided. And that's why Biden's in the trouble he's in. That's why we're in the trouble we're in. It's because everybody is only stuck in one mind. This is good, that is bad. And that mind is insufficient 
for a country of 360 million people. Governing a country this size is like washing and waxing a cat. It's nearly impossible. So people have to be willing to give things up. People have to be willing to moderate what they want and their impulses. And the only way they can actually do that is not necessarily by intellect, but by bathing in emptiness, by realizing that what they like and what they don't like is all contained in emptiness. So when everything fails, when we're in a situation where everything is falling apart, what can we control? There's only one thing on earth. That's our intention. And we practice fixing that intention the same way we practice fixing our posture and our mudra in Zazen. We carry that intention to be helpful, to be compassionate, to realize that life is both single and infinite at the same time. And that we are apt to, in our thinking, apt to run to extremes in one or the other, the one we favor. But unless we're completely fluid inside and able to migrate back and forth, we're just cutting in half the number of people that we can talk to. I'm not sure that Dharma talks like this are helpful in this moment, but I do them because it's my intention to be helpful. So even if I fail, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best to express my understanding of the world that it is and to translate it into terms that will be meaningful to those of you that are listening. I can't claim success. I can't claim a methodology. I can only hearken to the Buddha that's me. You can only hearken to the Buddha that's you, which is no Buddha, which is emptiness, which is the manifestation of this entire world. So, I can't think of more to say about that this morning. So I'll just say that I'm very happy that you've joined this Dharma talk. I'm going to try to find your comments. I'm going to try to learn how to work Facebook so that I can, they've changed it. Somehow I can't see anyone anymore. Uh, I wish you all well. I wish you continue your practice. I hope that you remember that we don't practice to win some permanent state of mind for ourselves, but we practice to make ourselves vehicles of Buddha, of emptiness, of compassion for every non-replicable event, which is the entire world. So I think on that note, I'll say the Metta prayer, I invite you to join me. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be happy and at peace. Thank you all very much.